Good evening, good evening. Welcome to the call, all millionaires. My name is Amma Nancy, and it is definitely a pleasure to be the host of the call this evening. Thank you all so very much for calling in, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this self-esteem development training call, Obsessed with Success. If this is your first time joining us, just to let you know, we do have these calls each and every Wednesday, and they are always filled with strategy and tips on self-esteem development, entrepreneurship, as well as secrets of the super wealthy. Trust me, millionaires, these calls will absolutely change your life. And it's not just me. These calls have helped thousands of people throughout the United States of America. So it is with special excitement that I am so pleased to introduce to the line Mr. Hazik Ali. Mr. Ali has a talent for bringing out the very best in people and seeing gifts in them that they do not even see in themselves. He helps people out for a living, and he totally does it for free as well. He's been an entrepreneur his entire life, and because of this, we call him as um, the entrepreneurologist. Mr. Ali is an author, a self-esteem development expert, my personal coach, my mentor, and my friend. Now, let me step out of the way and introduce to the line Mr. Hazik Ali. Are you on the line, sir? <laughs> I am. I am. Thank you very much for that incredible intro, Ms. Nancy. You got tripped up on that entrepreneurology work. <laughs> well, welcome, millionaires, to the call. And um, This is going to be a real good one. Since you guys are here on time, like, real quick, write this down. These are the four metrics that rainmakers score higher on than all the sheep, right? These are the four metrics, and that gives you a little bit of a clue. Here they are. Write these down. Engagement. Engagement. That means they have an action bias, right? That means they, they, they really would rather be working, right, <laughs> whether it's on work or their goals. The second one is dominance. They usually have a tendency to exercise power and influence over others. The third one is motivating others. They always rank higher on being transparent about their stories so that they're able to motivate other people. Did you know a lot of times that's all it takes? for you to inspire others, for you to be honest about your frailties and your failures and, you know, the the horrible things that have happened, you know. You don't know, man. That stuff is gold. And then the fourth one is risk-taking. And I also want you to jot this down. Research has confirmed there's absolutely no difference between male and female rainmakers. They all score high in these four categories. I want you to put an eye on those. Welcome to episode number 162. If you're just now joining us, my name is Hazik Ali, and this is Obsessed with Success. We have a heck of an episode for you today. This is a good time to be text messaging your family and friends because if you look at it, and I mean you look at it carefully, this is the stuff that success is made out of, these distinctions. All we're doing is hunting for distinctions. We're hunting for those aha moments that can add some texture on to that road that we're following to our dream, right? And um, what we're talking about today is rainmakers. So make sure you text message your family and friends. We're going to talk about uh, Jay-Z. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this movie I just now saw about Ray Kroc. You know, I thought I knew, but I had no idea. <laughs> you know, we're going to talk about, you know, everybody from Bill Gates to Michael. These are rainmakers. And then I'm going to give you 10 things that we can learn from Jay-Z's life, and I'm going to give you four secrets of rainmakers, four secrets of rainmakers. So hopefully you've had some time to kind of like, um, I don't know, contact the people that you love and that matter to you. Millionaires, they always try to tell us, if you look through legends of entrepreneurs, right, they always try to tell us that if you build a better mousetrap, then the world will find you, right? If you build it, they will come. Man, if you look at the people that studied, listen, study some billionaires. Man, don't none of them do that? Half the time? No, way more than that. I put out a statistic on Instagram um, a minute ago. Write this down. And if you don't believe me, study it. Two-thirds of the billionaires that are living right now, at least the ones that are on the books, I ain't talking about the Trilateral Commission and the Illuminati, you know, right? But no, the ones that are on the books, two-thirds of them 
are self-made. Two-thirds of them are self-made. And what you will find shocking if you are drinking that Kool-Aid about building a better mousetrap is that uh, most of them, I'm talking about most of them never invented a thing. Look at Bill Gates, right? Like everybody always talks about Bill Gates. and how, Do you know that Bill Gates was a rainmaker? Do you know that Bill Gates was a rainmaker? Listen, the way Bill Gates did it was that, first of all, this you're talking about a guy who sold his first uh, uh, language before he even wrote it, right? He fell in love with computers early, sure. He happened to live in a town with one of the first computer labs in a high school. That's true. But listen, it's the fact that he decided to step out there and take a risk. It's the fact that he decided to be uh, some, some, somewhat of a more dominant personality versus somebody who's passive and just is told what to do. He looks up the magazine. He calls them. He offers them a com- – it was this company called MITS, M-I-T-S. He called them and offered them a language that he hadn't even written yet. Next, he sat down with uh, who, who we now know as the owner of the Seattle Super Sun, Paul Allen. He sits down with Paul. They write the language. What's my point? My point is that rainmakers add value. He already knew about computers. He knew that they would need this extra component that he was adding. They end up buying it for $3,000. What did he do? He kept the copyright. Why? Because he sensed that that was the value add, the software. Everybody else was in love with the hardware and these pretty little boxes called computers. Millionaires, where's the value? Bill Gates didn't even invent the DOS. Everybody says that Bill Gates, uh, uh, they they always talk about like how uh, Microsoft copied Apple. Man, neither one of them invented it. Xerox invented it. Xerox just didn't use it correctly, Um, um, the the, the graphic interface. If you want to be a rainmaker, you've got to get comfortable with the idea of looking at things that exist and then just adding more value onto it. Same thing with Sam Walton. This dude was so notorious for walking around. One of my friends is reading uh, Made in America right now, the Sam Walton biography. This dude was so infamous for walking around with a tape recorder that Kmart banned tape recorders in the store. This dude was tirelessly shopping for new distinctions. Other people had thought of discount retailing way before him. But in the words of Drake, you know, poet laureate Drake, it ain't about who did it first, it's about who did it right. You're looking like preach. So then, I just now saw this movie, uh, by, uh, it's called Founder, it, it was about uh, Ray Kroc, right? And this movie is incredible. I highly suggest it um, for those that want to uh, sort of study history. But for those that are obsessed with success, and obviously if you're here, you feel the way I do, listen, man, this movie was a study in being a rainmaker. This guy was already a successful salesman. Um, I mean, successful to the point that they had a house to live in. His wife was a member of the country club. This guy's uh, late, late 49, late 50s. He'd done everything from sell paper cups uh, to sell all types of little widgets and gadgets. It was almost like a joke among his friends who were stable financially, uh, just because they had good jobs, right? Managing things, et cetera, so forth. They could not understand his life as a salesman. And it was sort of like a joke to them. But um, he's calling around, really grinding it out with this milkshake mixer that he had come along with. Um, and his secretary, when he calls in, lets him know that this one place wants six mixers. Now, these other people don't want one. I mean, the movie's just showing you he, he'd be on the road, uh, uh, at night, he'd be listening to personal development, um, you know, listening to the power of positive thinking, the power of persistence. You know, I don't know if you know about Ray Kroc, but that's one of his main things that he would champion, just the fact that you cannot, he will not ever give up. 
the whole idea that persistence and grit is the great separator, right? So at any rate, he's, um, he, he gets this message from his secretary, and the secretary is like, oh, you know, this, this one uh, uh, restaurant wants six of them. He's like, six? You've got to have that wrong. He calls them, and then they say, you know what? Matter of fact, make it eight. Right then and there, he says, I've got to see this restaurant because he's been doing this for a while in the food services industry, like I said, from Paper Cup Sun. And so he feels like he's seen it all. He goes out there, and what he sees blows his mind. I'm talking about they don't have any silverware. They only got nine items on the menu. People eat it right out of the wrapper. They go from grill to burger in 30 seconds. His mind is blown. He starts harassing him to let him franchise. They had tried it before, but not with his enthusiasm. He begins to add value. How? Because he sees that this is something that everybody needs along Route 66. He knows it flat out. Before you know it, he bangs out a deal with him. He's got 100 stores before you can bat an eyelash, but his deal is still 1.9%. The brothers, the McDonald's brothers, excuse me, I forgot to mention that. This store was called McDonald's. Notice his name is called Ray Kroc. But the store, the restaurant, was run by the McDonald's brothers. So Ray Kroc convinces them to let him franchise. He's got 100 stores before he can bat an eyelash, and he's still broke. Until he bumps into a guy who overhears him in a bank, according to the way the movie goes, and helps him add value again. So the first value he added was the fact that he distributed this concept all throughout America, middle America, et cetera, right? But here's where he added value for the second time when he bumps into a guy and a guy explains to him, you're not in the restaurant business. You'll never get rich off 1.9%. My friend, you are in the real estate business. Millionaires, when I tell you that this incredible movie begins to detail how this guy today owns 40%. That, that corporation, which eventually became, it was first the, the, the franchise realty corporation, but eventually in just a chilling move, he ends up calling it the McDonald's Corporation. And you'll have to see the movie for how he, you know, some would say kind of like, I don't know if you want to say snake them out of their uh, name. I don't, I don't know how you want to put it. I mean, he paid them handsomely for it, but my goodness, it is a movie for you about being a rain maker because the whole idea is you've got to look at a situation and you've got to see more than the average person does. You've got to be able to look at it like a visionary. You've got to be a rainmaker. The whole idea in the ancient term of the rainmaker came from Native American mythology, but some would say it was reality where these guys would literally be able to get in touch with a certain vibration dance a certain routine, a certain tradition, and then literally make it rain. You have to understand that when you don't eat, if there's a drought, the rainmaker is a very powerful person. Well, today we call that person billionaires. We call that person CEOs. We call that person, listen, they are everywhere. Millionaires, we just now saw an incredible, Incredible Rainmaker story with Jay-Z, didn't we? What did Jay-Z just now do? Jay-Z just now, and he's done this over and over again. You got to remember that Jay-Z is the same guy who, and, and, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute, right? But this is the same guy who got offered this crappy deal from Iceberg, which was this clothing line that he was making really, really hot, right? And he decides to just start a competing clothing line since they disrespected him with such a weak deal. But what did he just do with title? Millionaires, he bought a company for $53 million two years ago, less than 800 days ago. He bought a company for about $58 million, low $50 million. He, um, it was some, a small European tech company, right? And everybody lambasted this guy for this. You know, they say, oh, he went from 20 million subscribers down to only 3 million. Oh, you know, he's getting killed by Spotify. He's getting killed by Pandora. What is he thinking? Why would he try to get into a a realm like that with the big boys? Okay, that's a cool move that he just now did, bringing in all of these other artists. 
But, hell, what are they thinking? This is why artists need managers. These guys don't know what they're doing. Blase, splee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Less than two years later, we'll call it about two years later, this guy sells one-third, not even the whole thing. He sells one-third of the company that he purchased for $50 million plus for $200 million. A lot of people forgot that he did that deal with Nokia. A lot of people forgot that he did that deal with Samsung. I mean, remember how he sold a million downloads of his phone? He's been on the cutting edge of technology. He's been looking at it like, what is the big play? How do you really get to it with this platform? Millionaires, that's rainmaker thinking. What makes this guy so incredibly insanely successful. Well, I'm going to run you down nine things real quick. All right, here's the first one. You got to say hustle, right? This is a guy who, you know, his dad left. His mother had to support the family by herself. He always says that that's how he got his work ethic, right? And he always will tell you, there's his book called Decoded. Without the work, the magic won't come. You can't be afraid, millionaires, to work super hard in the beginning. I mean, inhuman. I'm talking about imbalanced level of work. You can't be afraid of that. The future will thank you if you start today. Nobody, millionaires, write this down. Nobody ever said, I wish I would have started later. Number two, don't wait until you have everything you need. Um, Jay-Z talked about in his Forbes interview how it just got to a point where he's like, make this decision. Is this something you really love? You love to do it? It's time to really focus on it, get serious about it, give it your all. Once I did it, there was no looking back. Now, how many entrepreneurs does that describe? I'm talking about you growing up in the projects. There's no drum kit. There's no, there's no production equipment, right? So what are you doing? You're doing the exact uh, sort of uh, religious practice, <laughs> right? Anything you do religiously, right? Is hip-hop not a religion for inner city uh, uh, youth worldwide? And, and, and what births all of this entrepreneurial spirit? It's this whole hip-hop thing that creates something from nothing that was birthed in a ghetto where there was nothing to do, and we had to literally just create it, right? Take some wires out of a lamppost and birth a billion-dollar industry 20, 30 years later. Listen, if you want something bad enough, you can make it happen. Stop waiting for everything you need and start deciding that that lack has been given to you to cut on your creativity. Number three, stop telling everybody your plan. Um, Jay Z tells this story, right? It's sort of famous if you follow him. You know, like I'm. I, that's I, I really uh I, I like this guy a lot. I like his moves a lot, right? And um, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. If you if you've heard of him, but um, when Jay Z was first getting started as a hip hop artist, he was coming up out of the streets, and so. Can you imagine he's telling his friends that he wants to be an artist and they're kind of looking down on him like those guys get exploited by these record labels. Like, what are you talking about? So if this is your circle and they're all just beating you down, you know, just imagine the feeling. So that taught him something really important. He was like, man, stop talking so much. A lot of times when you're talking, it's to wear out your energy from actually working. He was like, sometimes you just got to zip it, even with your closest friends and family. They can't see your vision. Their responses might be discouraging. A lot of times they've never even seen what greatness looks like. Sometimes you just got to act. Actions speak louder than words. Number four, skills are transferable. Now, Jay-Z never went to business school. I mean, if we can't learn that from him, what can we learn? That didn't stop him from founding multiple $100 million-plus companies. This is the guy that served as the co-brand director for Budweiser. Don't forget. Now, other people were in school getting their MBA from somebody who don't even have a business, right? 
but Jay-Z was learning real life business now. <laughs> I mean, it was selling drugs, right? But I mean, you're learning sales, you're learning management, you're learning promotion, right? <laughs> Skills are transferable. Millionaires, it is not your uniqueness that makes you valuable. It is not the fact that you're the only you on the planet, even though that's true. It's the fact that you serve. What makes you valuable is how much and how well you serve. Always look out for how the skills you're gaining in one world can help you in another one. Number five, know how to handle rejection. Now, this is a guy who got turned down by every single record label in music. This is now a guy, I, I, I believe, with this title thing, because he got $200 million, then he got another $75 million for his artist partners, right? Another $75 million, I'm going to say that again, for his artist partners to stream this thing through Sprint, right? But this is the whole point. Every time this guy's been rejected, he turns it into a stepping stone. He turns obstacles into opportunities like nobody else I've ever studied except all the other titans. They made him start his own record label. And then he sold it back to some of the same industry people that turned him down. Iceberg Apparel plays with him, offers him some disrespectful endorsement deal. He starts a clothing line, sells it 10 years later for $200 million. What can you do with some of the rejection that you're getting? Number six, write down a plan. Write down a plan. When Jay-Z, Damon Dash, and a guy named Biggs Burke, Kareem Burke, founded Rockefeller Records back in the early 90s, they wrote down the plan. And what I love about uh, this one quote that I found is that he actually talks about the principles we study. People think that I always make this joke about how Master P was one of the greatest motivational speakers of all time. Like all this stuff about no limit soldiers and 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 uh, and and um, the fact that uh, you got to get your mind right. It's clear that these guys were studying personal development. But listen to this quote: We made us we made short and long term projections. We kept it realistic. But the key thing is that we wrote it down, which is as important as visualization in realizing success. Mm, That's a clue. Make sure you write your plan down on paper. Stop keeping it in your head with these other 60,000 thoughts you're having every day. Sometimes we think we know how it's all going to play out, but there's nothing wrong and there's nothing sweeter and more efficient than putting it down on paper. That's when it gets real. Number seven. Don't take your eyes off the prize. Now, we've all heard the story from Hollywood. Every every industry, Jay-Z's industry is no different. Of course, he comes from the music business, right? These guys get huge, and then their addictions and their their, uh, weaknesses, their vices, crash them, right? They crash and burn. Well, It's interesting. With Jay-Z, he was forced to have it where his music uh, career and his business career took off at the same time, right? So he kind of had to keep a level head. He talks about champagne all the time. He talks about drinking and, 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 and margaritas, but he only drinks in a light way, um, unless he celebrates, you know, like, um, for those that you that don't know, you know, that's my background in music business. That's one of my backgrounds. And um, one of my producers is one of his producers. And so, you know, I've, I've got a certain perspective on this guy where I want you to understand that you've got to separate what they show you. you got to sep- see, you got to stop looking at people like heroes and start looking at them like mentors. Don't do what they say. Do what they do. You get my – okay, all right. So don't take your eyes off the prize. Nobody's doing drugs like that. Number eight, 
dream enormous. Dream enormous. Good grief. We talked about it with this new president, and you got to mention it when you're talking about being a rainmaker. How the heck? I mean, what are the odds that you would grow up in the project that now you can see a stadium that at one point you were a part owner of? I mean, I mean, literally, you could see the Brooklyn Nets arena from Marcy Project where he grew up. Now, he ended up having to divest his interest so that he could run full fledged it with the sports agency thing. But you get my point. You got to dream big. Accomplishing the enormous starts with the ability to imagine. You will never be able to do what they call impossible until you can see what we say is invisible. Number nine, demand your respect. You know, back in 99, Jay-Z won his first Grammy for that Hard Knock Life song. We're like, right, with using an Annie soundtrack. But he ain't show up. Why? Because he was upset that the Grammys was not publicizing the hip-hop category. He felt that was disrespectful, so he never even showed up. Now, with you, it might be in the workplace. With you, it might be with a customer or a client you're dealing with. But what can you do to make sure that you claim your respect. And then number 10, we can't even leave this subject without discussing this one, and that is you got to accept help from mentors, millionaires. I know as an entrepreneur, you're a strong-minded individual. I know. I know you're, you're really smart. You just read this book that you just want to share the knowledge from it. I get it. I understand. But please believe me when I tell you, the true mark of wisdom, the true mark of knowledge, if you really understood what that book was really doing for you, what you would understand is that you're getting it from the book because that's somebody that knows something you don't. Well, do you know there are people around you just like that? You've got to accept help from mentors. You've got to seek out coaches. You've got to look for people who you can model. If you will model somebody's mentality, character, and habits, you will get their results. A good mentor has already been in your position. They've been there, done that, and gotten a T-shirt. And Jay-Z has never stopped seeking the guidance of mentors throughout his career. Some of his mentors, somebody asked me the other day. I found for you. Russell Simmons, co-founder of Def Jam Records. A guy named uh, uh, Christopher Wallace. We know him in the music industry as Biggie Smalls, a notorious B.I.G., that was one of Jay-Z's mentors. Another one is Michael Jordan, six-time NBA champion, Michael Jordan. Now, out of all of them, I think the last one's the most important. You've got to get mentors if you intend on doing things with yourself because at the end of the day, there are people that already know questions you haven't thought of yet, much less answers. Millionaires, we're talking about being a rainmaker, though. So, like, before we get to the uh, uh, kind of like the five secrets and, and, and the thing that drives these people, I want to show you one more example of what it takes to um, – because, see, what you got to understand about being a rainmaker is that The reason that you're able to sell more than everybody else, the reason that people like you more than they like everybody else, the reason that more people give you the gift of influence over their lives more than they do anybody else is because rainmakers, and write this down, this is important, they either add value or they acknowledge and appreciate value that already exists. I'm going to say that again. They either add value or they acknowledge and appreciate value that already exists. Do you notice that pattern with Ray Kroc? Do you notice that pattern with Jay-Z? Do you notice that pattern with uh, Bill Gates? Now, if Michael Dell 
is not an example. I don't know how many of you guys know who Michael Dell is. I'm sure you've heard of the Dell computer. Um, this guy is always like in the top 20 richest people in the world, well, well in America at least. And um, Even though what, what I think is amazing about his story, and I just want to share it with you, um, I mean, because listen, computers and technology in our whole world is known for innovation. So I just find it mind-blowing that here's another example of a titan who ain't invented nothing. Now, I'm not saying that he's not a smart, innovative guy. You know, I mean, their company makes about 70,000 computers a day at this point. But what I'm saying is he's unabashed about going on a record saying, look, I'm interested in making money, not a bunch of products. If you invent something nobody wants to buy, I don't care. And this dude was just 18 when he saw the opportunity that was going to make him, by 31, the youngest CEO to ever enter the Fortune 500, Michael Dale. you got to Google this guy. By the age of 24, he had 1,600 employees and was worth $100 million. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Dale. This dude starts assembling computers from components in his room. But way before that, he was a hustler. We're talking about a guy who took up stamp collecting when he was 12. Then he would set up his own little mini auctions. The dude made $2,000. He wasn't a teenager yet off an auction just trading it because he was doing it like stock and currency trading. Next thing you know, he takes a job selling subscriptions to the Houston Post. He noticed that people were more willing to I want you to I want you to just catch the stuff in these stories. You've got to study these people. He noticed that people were most likely to buy subscriptions when they had just moved or just gotten married. So what did he do? He got lists of recently issued marriage licenses. He got lists of the addresses of new home buyers and then he targeted them. He would send out personalized letters. He would go to work after school and on the weekend. One day, his history uh, teacher, who was also his economics teacher, they had them doing these folks kind of like uh, tax returns. And um, he thought he had the decimal point wrong because he saw that he had made $18,000. And then when she realized that it wasn't a mistake, she was kind of annoyed because he had made more than her. I can kind of relate to that, you know, for a couple of different reasons um, for those that know my story. But this is the whole point. Their parents wanted him to be a doctor. This guy goes to college, University of Texas. But again, he saw something where he could add value. We call that an opportunity. The negative call that a complaint. This dude, when he was 15, buys an, an Apple computer. He takes it apart, right? Don't forget, he's making all this money selling stamps. He took that computer apart, and what he found out is that the Apple, I mean, I'm telling you, none of these guys invent nothing. It was made with components from all these other companies other than Apple. So he was like, shoot, if you know where to buy the different parts and you put it together, you've got yourself a computer. So what did he do? He launched Dell Computer. His first thing was just simple supply and demand. He heard from all these local IBM dealers, and, and, and he knew they were overstocked. So what did he do? He bought a bunch of IBM with uh, uh, PCs wholesale, and then because he sold them through the classifieds, he could undercut the price. Man, he made eighty thousand dollars before he could blink. And then what made his sauce so different is that he could add literally value. He would build in disk drives. He could soup up the computer to suit each customer. Nobody would ever heard of doing something like that. And he would hide it from his parents. His parents would come to the dorm room. He'd be hiding boxes and stuff in the bathroom. But, man, by the end of the first year, when he made $50,000, he just went in and dropped out. And, like, hey, mom, dad, look, long story short, he moves into a, a what you call a storefront in Austin, Texas, $6 million worth of hardware first year. The next year, he starts uh, 
kind of like putting together, I don't know if you've seen any of these movies, like from Steve Jobs or the birth of Apple computers, how all of these things are just starting basements and whatnot. But listen, because this dude was dealing direct to customer, he could cut out all the middlemen and charge lower prices. He's right there able to change as the audience tells him what they want. He can see what's selling quicker. He can see what doesn't sell at all. At one point in 1987, and, and you know, this is how he came up with the 24-hour kind of customer line that he's known for to this day, right? He was getting 2,500 calls a day in response to his ads. Did I mention he was still only 20 years old? My point is that the reason that Dell, which now has close to like $70, $80 billion in sales a year, got to get to this position is because Michael Dell was a rainmaker. So how do these guys come into existence? Like, what can you do? To become a rainmaker, like how can you kind of um, transform your own mindset so that wherever you are, you can just blossom where you're planted? Write this down. Here is the premise that sums up rainmaker strategy better than any other, and you're going to notice it in every story that I told you this afternoon. Write this down. Gain control of an asset and increase its value. This book I read one time called The People's Principles. It's amazing. And what the guy taught me in that book is that you can make money in real estate three different ways. You can make money by holding the actual property. You can make money by having the money, right? Or you can make money by having the information. Do you know that there is value in just the information? You can write out a contract you can control this piece of property with a piece of paper. Say, hey, give me 15 days to sell this. If I can get it, then let me have this much commission. And then you can go to the person that was looking to buy a house just like this, right? And you never even owned the property. All you did was get somebody to sign a piece of paper, gain control of an asset, and increase its value. What separates Warren Buffett? You know, everybody calls him the world's greatest investor, right? What separates him from all these masses that just invest and just go? It's because when he buys companies, he's looking to influence the strategy. Man, listen, this whole idea is the fun. Write this down, Warren Buffett quote. It's much better to find a great company at a fair price than find a fair company at a great price. I'm going to say that again. It's much better to find a great company at a fair price than find a fair company, a company that's only fair, just fair, at a great price. What does he mean by that? Warren Buffett is notorious for going into companies that are undervalued because he can see some other use for what it is they do, and that's how he makes them large. Another way you can do it in real estate is like you can you can get some property that's zoned residential and then politic with some with some with some uh, government officials and get his own commercial. That's why so many people have a problem with the new president. Billionaires do not buy low, sell high. Sometimes when stuff is low, it's because it's crap. If you don't come up with a plan for enhancing its value. It's only going to get worse. It's going to get cheaper. So millionaires, here are uh, five kind of like secrets to to uh, kind of like finding that that value, adding that value. Here's the first one: carefully and thoroughly do your homework. You've got to do pre-call planning. You've got to know exactly what your strategy is before you walk in there. Bill Gates did not just call that magazine and freestyle his conversation, I guarantee it. He already knew exactly what he was going to say and why. He already uh, uh, knew the value that he wanted to add. He knew what he wanted out of the conversation. You've got to do your homework. I mean, you should spend three hours planning a 15-minute call. You might spend three weeks planning a five-minute 
uh, appointment. Secret number two, dollarize. One thing about Rainmakers is you don't sell products, you don't sell services. You dollarize. What do I mean by that? The whole idea is that you're not telling them, for instance, that they're signing up for $129 so that they can make $10,000 a month. No. You don't sell the comp plan. You dollarize the features and benefits. You dollarize, like, like if you're in network marketing, you get 450 deductions. The minute they sign up, they're already able to write off $600 a month. You dollarize it. What you're doing is selling the sizzle, not the steak. Secret number three, rainmakers always know the answer to one question. Write this down. I'm going to say it slow. If I were the customer and knowing what I know about my company, about my product, about the competition, about the customer, why would I do business with me? I hope you caught that. Whether you're talking about Ray Kroc, dealing with these franchisees, or dealing with the McDonald's brothers, or whether you're talking about Michael Dale, dealing with these customers. It's always about why should the customer do business with me? This is what gives you that rock-solid confidence when you're talking to them. Learning the answer to this has to be a part of that homework from step one. Secret number four. I'm only giving you five, and we're almost out of here. Secret number four. You got to ask for the sale. On every sales call, whenever you're on the line with a decision maker, whenever you got a shot and you see the guy that runs that department sitting there by the bar, you got to go up to fortune favors the bold. 90% of even salespeople don't ask for it. So imagine regular people that just consider themselves the kind that hate sales and all of that. Man, they're getting run over out here. You got to realize everything is sales, and then you have to realize that there's nothing wrong with it. It's the most honorable sport in the world as long as you have value. And guess what? If you don't, you ain't going to last long anyway. You've got to ask for the order. Here's number five. All right. In baseball, um, if you're familiar with baseball, a lot of times you'll see a player who um, doesn't really have confidence that, okay, because uh, for, for the ladies, on the, I shouldn't even say for the ladies. Ooh, that sounded chauvinist. <laughs> for everybody on the line that doesn't understand how baseball works, you know, the pitcher will throw the ball, the, the batter will hit it, and then the batter's trying to round the bases before somebody catches it and throws them out. Well, sometimes you'll see somebody hit the ball, right? And they'll just have a feeling because it's a pop fly that they're going to get thrown out, right? They, they just have this feeling that they're going to get thrown out. So they kind of just do this slow trot. It's just that, you know, they got to do it, so they're doing it. They're just going through the motions, right? Not rainmakers. See, the thing about rainmakers is they're running full out every time because there's got to be a chance that outfielder could drop the ball. There could be a chance that when he throws it in, somebody could fumble it. There could be a chance that somebody com com uh, 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 commits an error of some sort, and the rainmaker is ready. Millionaires, you have to have the rainmaker state of mind. It is what being millionaire-minded is all about. Or should I say billionaire-minded? I hope you got something from this. I hope this was uh, uh, kind of like an um, um, aha moment for you. I hope something that we said helped to shift something in your perception. If you got here late and you missed the four metrics that Rainmakers always score higher in than the rest of the population, and here's a hint, 
There's no difference between male and female. If you missed that, then make sure you join Dear Millionaire. If you've never done it, I'll tell you how real quick before we get out of here. Put your phone on speakerphone. Put your phone on speakerphone. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Put your phone on Okay, and then compose a text message to 81010. 81010. And the message you will send in will simply read at Mill Mind. Just like an Instagram, like how our Instagram is at We Are Millionaire Minded. What you're going to send in right now to 81010 is at Mill Mind with two L's. At Mill Mind. Send that in to 81010. It'll write you right back and ask you your name. And then just like that, you're enrolled. And Dear Millionaire, doesn't that have a good ring to it? It's going to literally call you a millionaire every day. And um, it's the world's first text message service for personal growth and self-development. We hope you get something out of it, and we hope you got something out of this. Millionaires, I'm going to leave you with a mantra like we always do. Um, if, If you got nothing else from this, please write this down. Either your mind has to expand to match your goals or your goals will just shrink to match your mind. Good night. Let's grow.